two, one. It sparks flashes of brilliance, prompts bold moves, and threads our wildest ideas together. So what exactly is the student spirit? Well, it's the part of us that's forever curious, a mindset where anything is possible. sharp between the ears and pays just a little more attention. It isn't afraid to make a statement. Changes the world one step at a time and squeezes our egos, insecurities and fears into tiny little metaphorical balls before crushing them. The curious don't just think. Stay curious. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We are so glad to welcome you as part of our community tonight. Please note that this webinar is being recorded and distributed live stream. By entering this virtual meeting room, you give your consent to be recorded and distributed by the Student Hotel Vienna and other third parties. If you prefer not to be recorded, please turn off your camera and or go to the Facebook live video feed, the link to which is being placed in the chat room. For a better experience, please turn off your microphone and set your video to gallery view. Testament. For my brothers Carl and Johann Beethoven. Oh, you men who think or say I am malevolent, stubborn, or misanthropic, how greatly do you wrong me? You do not know the secret causes of my seeming. From childhood, my heart and mind were disposed to the gentle feelings of goodwill. I was even eager to accomplish great deeds, but reflect now that for six years I have been a hopeless case, aggravated by senseless physicians, cheated year after year in the hope of improvement, finally compelled to face the prospect of a lasting malady whose cure will take years or perhaps be impossible. Born with an ardent and lively temperament, even susceptible to the diversions of society, I was compelled early to isolate myself, to live in loneliness. When I at times tried to forget all this, oh, how harshly I was repulsed by the doubly sad experience of my bad hearing. And yet it was impossible for me to say to men, speak louder, shout, for I am deaf. Ah. How could I possibly admit such an infirmity of the one sense which I should ha in, sh which should have been more perfected in me than in others? A sense which I once possessed in highest perfection, a perfection such as few surely in my profession enjoy or have enjoyed. Oh, I cannot do it. Therefore, forgive me when you see me draw back when I would gladly mingle with you. My misfortune is doubly painful because it must lead me to being, under, to being misunderstood. For me, there can be no recreations in society of my fellows, refined intercourse, mutually ex mutual exchange of thought. Only just as little as the greatest needs command May I mix with society. I must live like an exile. If I approach near to people, a hot terror seizes upon me, a fear that I may be subjected to the danger of letting my condition be observed. Thus it has been during the last half year which I spent in the country, commanded by my intelligent physician to spare my hearing as much as possible. In this, almost meeting my present natural disposition, although I sometimes re-encounter to it, yielding to my inclination for society. 
But what a humiliation when one stood beside me and heard a flute in the distance, and I heard nothing. Or someone heard the shepherd singing, and again I heard nothing. Such incidents brought me to the verge of despair, but little more and I would have put an end to my life. Only art it was that withheld me. Ah, it seemed impossible to leave the world until I had produced all that I felt called upon me to produce. And so I endure this wretched existence, truly wretched, an excitable body which a sudden change can throw from the best into the worst state. Patience, it is said that I must choose now for my guide. I have done so. I hope my determination will remain firm to endure it until please the inexorable Parsi to break the Fred. Perhaps I shall get better. Perhaps not. I am prepared. Forced already in my 28th year to become a philosopher. Oh, it is not easy. Less easy for the artist than for anyone else. Divine one, thou lookest into my inmost soul. Thou knowest it. Thou knowest that love of man and desire to do good live therein. Ludwig van Beethoven was at the end of his 31st year when he signed his last will and testament. It was late summer in Heiligenstadt, a lush, hilly, hilly village overlooking the Danube from the border of Vienna. He drafted this testament from the small cozy room that had become his temporary home that summer. That document, Beethoven's written recognition that he was losing his hearing and was powerless to do anything about it, and his sincere expression of grief for the death of his most precious asset, may be considered the most highly regarded missive of modern Western art music. Beethoven was predestined to fulfill the prophetic assignment of creating a new music for a new humanity. But rather than having been advantaged with superhuman health for that superhuman task, he would suffer from progressive hearing loss. Beethoven was in his late twenties when he started to come to terms with it. At the very moment he was maturing into his prime years, both personally and professionally, he in silent loneliness, had to struggle with the fact that he was losing his hearing. Those who had the luxury of wasting away their lives in bestial oblivion, as Hamlet calls it, were given the tools that Beethoven needed to complete his life's mission. They seemed to mock Beethoven by asking him if the carefree melody of the flute sounding just beyond the distance of his hearing was music to his ears. Nothing could be farther removed from his reality. As our esteemed guest, the psychotherapist Victor Araldo emphatically notes, as of today, Victor and his colleagues in the medical profession, not only would they cure, uh, excuse me, as our esteemed guest, the psychotherapist Victor Araldo emphatically notes, as of today, Victor and his colleagues offer the medical treatment Beethoven cried out for. Thanks to the tireless work of Victor and his colleagues in the medical profession, not only would they cure Beethoven's deafness and give him the ability to physically hear better than anyone else, but they would take care of his mental health too. Though many of us are still uncomfortable speaking up about our mental health issues, as of 2015 at least, mental health expenditures became the largest single medical expense, not just in the West, but in the entire world. Today, thanks to our brave medical professionals, it is taken for granted that mental health is human health. Simeon, you're probably thinking to yourself, You've just wasted 10 minutes of Victor's time telling us about hearing disorder. Now is not the time to tell us about your many mental disturbances. The reason I bring up mental health is that hearing disorders are accompanied by the mental health problems that Beethoven detailed in his testament. Those of us with hearing loss know it all too well. Hearing loss does not result in a calming, peaceful silence. What replaces hearing loss is called tinnitus. 
It is an offensive, uncomfortable, and constant ringing in our ears. Imagine being in the bell tower of one of the great cathedrals at noon. Tinnitus is a phantom noise and constantly reminds us of our disability, adding insult to hearing loss injury. So yes, physical and mental health should be understood as two sides of the same coin. The psychotherapist Victor Iraldo is at the cutting edge of his discipline. Victor is internationally renowned for his work in tinnitus, hyperacusis, and vertigo therapy. He earned a degree in psychology from the University of Saarland, a degree in music therapy from the University of Applied Sciences Heidelberg, and a degree in music from Oberlin College. He practices in English, German, and Spanish. Tonight, it is our privilege to welcome him to speak about health issues that have an outsized impact on our lives, but still today are too often left untreated. Beethoven should be pleased. Victor, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Simia. Um, it's a very appropriate introduction for what we are going to talk about today. I, I didn't know you were going to um, quote Beethoven's testament. Um, so I'm sorry I had to leave while you were speaking. I, I decided we, we should change uh, our opening uh, piano example, because um, originally it was going to be Bach, um, but I think it, it makes now more sense to, to play Beethoven. No? And perhaps his, his most, or one of his most well-known uh, examples. I heard this when I was 11, uh, 11 back in, in, in Colombia. And I remember uh, this moment in particular because it opened a feeling I didn't know until that moment. Uh, a very sad feeling, which I, was, I, I have never experienced. Um, and this shows, uh, yeah, what was going in, in Beethoven's uh, emotional life. I'll just pay, play a few seconds. So Victor, so tell us about uh, your relationship with this music. Uh, first of all, sorry, I see Aaron, a, a fellow composer. I'm happy to see you. Uh, it's the only person I see uh, at my screen. Uh, and sorry about not, not ending this on the same key we started it on. <laughs> but I mean, I, I was, uh, yeah. So what is the the place of music in my life. Yes, um, I guess this is the best example to begin with because it, it opened a, a new world of emotions. It was exactly that moment which I remember as being uh, crucial in my relationship with music. I started playing the piano when I was nine because my mother suggested it. She knew a, a piano teacher in, in Bogota um, and it was a nice thing to do, mm, some coordination, learning a new thing. Uh, music at school 
was before that, I guess, one of my uh, worst subjects. Uh, and after that, of course, I, I knew how to solve it and, and it changed uh, very quickly. Mm, yeah, so it was this uh, opening towards emotion. That was the first thing music gave me. And later, especially with Bach, um, a very peaceful feeling as well, uh, almost a religious feeling if, I mean, when we listen to Bach's music and a, and a balance, no matter what is happening. And if you look at Bach's life, you see a lot of tragedies going on. He lost his two parents when he was nine and ten, a few months apart. Then he married and had either seven or thirteen ch children with his first wife. He then went on vacation to Bohemia, and when he came back, his wife had died. Her funeral had already taken place. Uh, and then he is with seven or 13 children. Um, yeah, then he married again, has uh, overall 20 children. Many of them died in infancy, which was common at the time. Uh, but he also lost a son when, he was, when the son was 20. So these tragedies were a constant in, in Bach's life. And here, very differently than with Beethoven, or early Beethoven especially, uh, you have somebody who, who is extremely balanced despite this tragedy. Uh, and so Bach's music, we don't know if he experienced this himself, but his music for sure gives us something um, beyond suffering, which brings us back to uh, awareness and you know, meditation or mindfulness, if, if we want to use this word. So, Victor, you began uh, at nine playing piano, and then, uh, as I understand it, when you were 15, you told your parents that uh, you weren't learning enough at school, that you had uh, better things to do with your time, and then you spent several months uh, kind of uh, learning by on your, uh, on your own. I was learning a lot at school, but uh, not the things that <laughs> I was interested in. Um, and it was a question of, of time also, because um, I, I was at a school that demanded a lot of its students. I don't know how, how it is in other schools, but uh, there was a, a work overload. So when I came home, I wanted to play piano and on the weekends. And there was just no time for it. And school got more and more difficult. I was not doing my homework because I was playing piano. And so it was just unbearable at one point. And it was a decision I thought of for, for months. And I was kind of delaying it, like saying, if this happens, then I will do this. Until at one point, it, I just couldn't go the next day. And that's what I told my my parents, um, it was decided for me. I, there was no way you, you would have stopped me. Uh, they, I mean, I was not gonna go. <laughs> and so I left um, in order to play piano. That was what I had, was, had in mind. Yeah. And what and would- the Piano teacher encouraged this a lot, so. Yeah. As, a, as a pianist then, what did you expect to, uh, what was your objective? Uh, yeah, to become a concert pianist. Uh, my piano teacher gave me a lot of records, a lot of videos, also uh, an aunt I had in Chicago. She would bring me these uh, DVDs of Leonard Bernstein uh, doing these youth concerts and Glenn Gould. And especially with Glenn Gould, you see a lot of passion and it's just contagious. So I, I, I wanted to become a concert pianist. Um, and it was motivated by my mother and my piano teacher. They were really into it as well. And what were your other musical influences at that time? So when I left school, uh, my piano teacher knew a composer. My piano teacher's name is Clarita Correa, and she knew Sergio Mesa, both of them from Medellin. And I took private lessons with him in composition, counterpoint. Um, and then my sister, which was studying, my oldest sister, which was studying architecture, she gave me a video of John Cage. I have nothing to say and I am saying it. And John Cage was really a huge influence in how I th thought about music and about things in, in general. 
So, Victor, uh, you eventually emigrated to the United States and studied at the Conservatory of Music uh, at Oberlin, uh, but you had this dream of becoming a concert pianist was actually shattered because uh, you got tendinitis from working too hard, from practicing too much. It must have been it must have been terrible after all of that work that you put in since you were nine years old. It was. It was. Uh, I was maybe yeah twenty or nineteen. It was my third semester at at Oberlin. Before I had already been composing, but I went to the conservatory uh, as a pianist, as a piano major, and. Um, Again, a lot of work overload, a lot of private stress also with, with myself, a lot of ambition, maybe not the right ambition. And yeah, I started having pain here, a lot of pain, which lasted maybe three or four days, but I didn't say anything to my piano teacher. I just went to lesson and, and played over the pain. Today, of course, I wouldn't do this. So I guess I learned the lesson. But at that point, I did it. Mm, that's how it got, uh, got worse. But then it got better after one week. And I said, OK, now I can work more for the week I lost. So I practiced even more. And then it was really bad. Shoulders, um, elbows, I couldn't sleep. I couldn't carry grocery bags. Uh, so I was like this for two years. Mm, yeah. I. I when I look back, back, it's yeah, perhaps the most difficult uh, time for me personally in my life. So you you moved from piano performance more to composition, a more philosophical field that has to do with writing, not with performance. No, uh, less stress, kind of uh, a, a lot of getting to know people's music, writing your own music. What kind of music do you compose? This change is exactly how you are uh, mentioning it. It was uh, absolutely free, creative. Uh, there was not this pressure to, not this perfectionism, because you are creating whatever you want to do. So there's no right or wrong. And I experimented a lot. As I mentioned, I studied counterpoint in Colombia. So I did some very old stylish pieces, Renaissance, um, and then some more atonal music, um, I'll just uh, play something to kind of... So 20th century music. Um, but in the 20th century or in the 21st, everything is allowed. So basically there's not really a style. Um, and I did a lot of experimental music influenced by John Cage. And this piece I'm, I'm going to, to perform uh, in one second. It was composed uh, between, I was in Michigan first for two years at the Interlocking Arts Academy. And I composed this in 1999. And it's, it's influenced by John Cage and my passion for, for soccer, because well, I, I love it as a sport. And it's for soccer ball, so it's not for, for piano. And it's a percussion piece in which the instrument is the soccer ball. And uh, a question, Victor, just quickly. What is this influence by John Cage you're talking about? I know him a little bit as a composer, but uh, w when you talk about this influence, what, what is your interpretation of that influence? John Cage is a, a composer from the United States. He started with Schoenberg, the famous 12-tone founder. And Schoenberg told him, that he didn't have any sense for harmony, no, no real talent for composing, and he would come to a wall at one point and can't, wouldn't go any farther. And John Cage answered, then I will spend my life beating my head against that, that wall. <laughs> so it, the same way Schoenberg pushed harmony or made a new system out of a harmonic system that couldn't go farther, uh, John Cage pushed it farther influenced also by other composers into including noise. So now it's not only about tones, but... So you have everything, and this continues today. 
which is fascinating because it makes us rethink our concept of what is music, so, what is art. In other words, instead of using a piano as an instrument, any object, anything in the world could be your instrument. The world is your instrument. Yes. The, the environment sounds become your music. He said, what is more musical, a, a violin playing in a conservatory or a music track passing by a conservatory? And most musicians don't like this idea because, mm, yeah, we are taught of thinking that art needs to be something special, which requires a lot of, of practice. For me, these ideas of John Cage were very liberating and, and helpful in, in a therapeutical way, as we will get on later, but also in a musical way, because, yeah, at the end, it is very subjective how we think of music and how we categorize good and bad. Okay. I just want to say one more thing about John Cage and it's his most famous piece, four minutes and 33 seconds, in case um, your audience doesn't, doesn't know this piece. It's, it lasts for four minutes and 33 seconds, so that's where the title comes from, uh, and it's just silence. So it was originally performed by a pianist who came on stage and, and sat there for, for four minutes and 33 seconds. No, it has three movements in which the piano, um, how do you call this? The uh, lid. The lid goes up and down to show the different movements. And yeah, the audience was of course very shocked at the time. Uh, people coughed, some people mm -hmm. laughed, some people left, some people spoke. And yeah, so every performance is what happens during this time because real silence doesn't exist we, we we will get to this later so yeah uh, your variations on a theme by pele correct okay so my one of my first compositions um, and also the one I, I feel most identified with
Bravo. Vieni vos. What a performance. Fantastic. I can I can tell you uh, that uh, I imagine that time you spent when you were 15 uh, was uh, worth the while because what an uh, innovative idea of music, like you said. That's um, a lot of thinking outside the box. Uh, I love it. And what a performance. Thank you. Thank you, Simi. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of sounds you can produce out of a soccer ball. And very complicated rhythms. When the shoe hits the ground like this, uh, the sofa sound, there's, there's tons of things going on. And uh, funny that uh, this piece has probably already become a classic, composed in 1999, and uh, I know that I, <laughs> I've seen it many times, and I look forward to uh, hearing so, it. So please like this video. Yes, yeah. we'll do so. <laughs> so tell us, moving on, about therapy, music therapy. What's your definition? Um, so music therapy is the use of music to achieve therapeutic goals. That's the, the official definition also of the German Society for Music Therapy. So it's in between three different areas, uh, music, psychology, and, and medicine. So you have all these three things coming together. So um, after your studies, I understand that you worked at one of the world's leading institutions uh, for treating tinnitus and hyperacusis. Could you tell us what is, uh, what is tinnitus? Tinnitus is uh, the so-called ringing of the ears. This can be a high-pitched sound or um, a low sound, uh, raush and shh, like, like the end of the soccer ball piece. Um, and it's very common, in fact. Uh, about 20% of the population has this at one point, uh, about 8%, uh, this becomes um, uh, chronic. But from this 8%, 75%, or sorry, 85% deal very good with it. So it's not really a problem. They have it, it's chronic, but it doesn't bother them. And then you have this 15%, which uh, suffer from it, it becomes an issue, they, it it's, stops them from doing things they want, they lose concentration, they become tied up, um, they have problems working uh, and might experience other symptoms like uh, depression, which might be there before or come later or at the same time, um, anxiety, social isolation, back pain, uh, how do you call this, uh, jaw, jaw problems, yeah. So, Tell us, what does a tinnitus course of therapy look like? Can you make it disappear? Can you cure it? That's what most people would like to, most patients. Uh, they, they come to therapy with this expectation. If the tinnitus doesn't, has not lasted that long, there's a huge probability that it goes away. So we speak of acute tin tinnitus up to three months, then uh, subacute, three to six months, and then chronic tinnitus, more than six months. There are people that have had tinnitus for 10 years and then one day it disappears. Uh, I don't know how to do this. I'm, I mean, if I knew this would be great, uh, but this just happens if it needs to happen. But it's not necessary for the therapy because the, the point you need to transmit in a tinnitus therapy is there are many sounds which are there which we are not aware of. For example, when you swallow saliva, there's a lot happening, happening in your ears. You, you can feel it if you concentrate on it, but your brain doesn't perceive it. When you walk, you're not perceiving every step you're taking. And so on. There are uh, airplanes, many, many sounds we ignore because we, we don't, it, they are not important. So this needs to be clear in a tinnitus therapy. It doesn't need to go away, 
for it to be not perceived. Because if it's there and you're not perceiving it, then you're not going to care about it. This is obvious, but it's, it's important to understand this. And uh, I see all these connections already with variations on a theme of Pele, because, for instance, I would never uh, pay attention to the sound of a soccer ball unless I was focusing on you performing that. Exactly, exactly. And what happens with tinnitus patients is they focus so much on this sound that they start ignoring everything else around them. So this retraining therapy, uh, a part of it is focusing on the sounds that are also there, which you are not uh, listening to, paying attention to. For example, as one patient told me about, we uh, have Schellen in English, Schellen uh, Mandarin. Opening, yeah, can. The opening of a mandarin. Uh -huh. Also, when you open a mandarin, this has a beautiful noise. If you become aware of this, uh, then you have something new. Many tinnitus patients have hearing loss. So if this is the case, and it is not the case uh, with everybody, but with many it is, you need um, headphones, no? prothesis, ear um, hearing aid, uh -huh. so that the opening of the mandarin or clementine becomes present again, because you might, you might not be able to hear it if you have a hearing loss. So tell us um, about this hierarchy of sounds. You know that there are different kinds of sounds, but like you said, through uh, conscious looking at hearing them and, and thinking about them, we can conceive of this hierarchy. Yes, um, we will uh, put a slide uh, I, I send it to your colleague. I will open my door. Light one second, please. Yeah, so here we have a hierarchy of sounds. And this explains why we perceive some sounds and ignore others. Why we ignore our swallowing of saliva for example. So what we don't ignore is this first category. If we have a sound that represents danger or survival, we will pay attention unconsciously. For example, if you hear a child shouting or if you um, listen to an ambulance, this is if an ambulance was a nice melody by Mozart, we would not listen to it. So it has to be a disturbing sound so that our brain says, okay, danger, survival, we are going to perceive this. Because you need to do something about it. The second category would be disturbing, annoying sound. So these things that, that annoy you. Let's say your car has uh, bad brakes. No? So the, the brakes are quitching when you are breaking. This is annoying and it's disturbing and it should be because it might be dangerous if you don't pay attention. So you go to the auto mechanic and the mechanic says everything is fine. You just have a, an older car. It won't go away but your brakes are fine. So you might get used to it and ignore it and don't even notice it anymore until somebody new comes in your car and um, and they notice it and you're like, oh yeah, I, I had forgotten this. So annoying and disturbing means either you have to accept it or change something. The third category is new, interesting sounds. For example, you are sitting in a cafe and they play your favorite song. And before you didn't even notice there's radio behind. And now they play, I don't know, uh, um, you know, it's, Cold play, and okay, I recognize that. And the last category is neutral sounds. We don't care about this. We would only notice them if there's absolutely nothing else. So the goal with tinnitus is that you move your judging of it from one to four so that it becomes neutral. 
because usually once when you become it when you have it for the first time you think oh this might be dangerous i might have a heart attack and you, you get panic which makes of course perception uh, more focused because it might be dangerous you go to doctor he says no it's just tinnitus but you have to live with it which doesn't really help you and then it might become disturbing and annoying perhaps it is a signal which is telling you to do something else. Maybe you need more uh, silence in your daily life. Or maybe more, more balance, more time for yourself. Or maybe you need to learn how to say no. And Tinnitus is trying to tell you this. And the, number three, there are cultures in North India and North America um, where people with Tinnitus are revered, like shamans, like gods because they think you hear voices from another world. So you have a message to tell. So it's like a lottery win if you have tinnitus. It might be good to think about this if you are suffering from this and put yourself in these situations. What we want is that it loses its importance or if it's a signal that you listen to it. So Victor, what you're saying is that there are certain sounds that are uh, actual physical phenomenon phenomena and then other sounds which actually come from our own uh, imagination and that we can actually train those to move down the hierarchy so that they don't bother us. Uh, sorry, can you repeat? Um, yes. I'm reading a chat. I'm sorry. You said that at the top of this hierarchy there are these very loud sounds that physically uh, warn us about that danger or about something important but like you said then there are also in the case of tinnitus we hear this sound and it's actually just um, we're tricking ourselves yes there are many um, studies where they try to figure out if people with the loudest tinnitus suffer the most and people with the softest suffer the least and it's not like this there are people with a very soft tinnitus that suffer a lot from it and people with a very, very loud tinnitus uh, would say it doesn't bother me at all. So loudness, you are right. In some cases, a very loud airplane might represent danger. I mean, imagine listening to an airplane 200 years ago. We would hide ourselves uh, on a bunker. Um, uh, but uh, even if somebody whispering can be very annoying. So loudness and volume, uh, yeah, it, it is the brain that decides on this. Amazing. Mm. Tell us about hyperacusis. What is it exactly? How can you treat it? So 40% of tinnitus patients also suffer from hyperacusis, which means oversensitivity to sound. So this is the example I'm talking about. Normal conversations might be unvariably loud. Although other people uh, don't have a problem and you yourself didn't have a problem before this. With hyperacusis, um, daily life becomes very problematic. Beethoven reports this in some of his letters that he, because he was suffering from gradual hearing loss, which included tinnitus and hyperacusis and also uh, vertigo, dizziness. Mm. And, and he says, yeah, it's funny because I don't hear these sounds, but when I hear them, they are extremely loud. So you, are, you don't know if you hear too good or, or too bad. So um, I, I, I'm reading here that you have some improvised examples to play for us so that we can test this for ourselves. Yes, let, let's do this. Uh, this applies both to tinnitus and hyperacusis. So the hyperacusis therapy works the following way. Uh, you have to, it's a habituation. You have to get used to sounds again. But that's more easily said than done. So you have to be very, very careful with these patients because if you do too much, you're going to lose them. You don't want to scare them. It's not a shock therapy, but you have to guide them exactly where they are. You have to give them the power to say, stop, 
So if I was playing this in a therapy, they could say to me, stop at any moment. And uh, we can use a Scala. Maybe we can put this slide right now. Or, or let's say, okay. Yeah, don't think about this too much when I play the example. Mm. But just try to overall think if what I'm going to play, which is improvised, uh, is pleasant. That would be two plus. If it's extremely unpleasant, which would be the other side. If it's in the, in the chat. One through five, very pleasant, two pluses, pleasant, plus, neutral, plus, minus, not pleasant, one minus, very unpleasant, two. So five is very pleasant. Is five very pleasant? Uh, yes, five is very pleasant and one is very unpleasant. Okay, so um, one would be very unpleasant, two would be unpleasant, this minus, neutral would be three, and four would be one plus, and five would be two plus. Okay, let's take this slide out, and I'm going to play a short example. So th this would be very difficult for somebody suffering from hyperacusis. They might even be all tied up already. So my job as a therapist would be to say, hey, we haven't even begun, and if you don't want, I'm not going to play at all but please relax your shoulder because we digest sounds metaphorically in three categories. Our body, our physiognomy, our heartbeat gets faster with certain music or slower, our respiration, our breath. Um, Gänsehaut, if you get chicken pox. Huh? Oh. <laughs> Whatever it's called, yeah. Chicken pox. <laughs> I think chicken pox is with something else, but okay. Just disease. <laughs> so you react with your body. Then you have uh, emotions. You get sad or you get happy or you get uh, fear or relaxed. And then you have your thoughts. So you recognize it's Beethoven uh, or it's reggaeton or it's whatever. Um, so your brain gets in, your, your thinking brain. Or that's my mother's voice. So I'll play this and you just have to, on the chat, write a number. If, if this is neutral, pleasant or unpleasant. I gave you a four. I thought that was pleasant. <laughs> and don't, for the other people, I, I don't care if you say very unpleasant, no? Because that's why I'm, I'm not playing anything I practiced. Four fours. Four fours. Five fours. Okay. So this would not be the case with uh, a hyperacusis patient. Or, or maybe, it, it depends obviously how they react to this. If, it, if they say four, this would be one plus, then there's nothing we need to do. In fact, you need a lot of these sounds if you are suffering from hyperacusis. We tell them every day when you go to sleep, think about your day and write five sounds that were pleasant to you. But let's say they had uh, one minus or two minus, I guess. Yes, one and two. Um, so then I, I would ask them, okay, if it's two minus, you might want to stop and not do anything else and say, okay, we'll come to this later. If it's one minus, then you have to develop strategies so that you move it for it to become neutral. Because they might say, oh, this sound, this was way too high and way too loud and too, too hard. It, it's, I have pain. So it's like, what can help you? Should I play less? 
maybe three seconds, or can you do breathing exercises, for example? So I will play it again, maybe shorter, and they will actively do breathing exercises. No, for example, an F. Or they might sing along, no? so they would do that. I will play and they will sing. I mean, they can imitate what I'm doing or do their own thing. No? But if you are singing, they are somewhere else now. Probabilities, um, it wouldn't bother them. Or they would just do... And when you practice these techniques, techniques, over time you don't need them anymore. So it's actually very easy to, to take care of a hyperacusis. But people don't know how to do it. If the barking of a dog is bothering you, my suggestion... Bark yourself when you get the dog barking. <laughs> yeah, I just had a patient from, from Argentina and this was his problem, among other frequencies. Um, and I was telling him, okay, next dog that comes, just go rush, rush, rush. Doesn't need to be loud. And it works. Just people are, are normally not willing to do this. <laughs> but if they do, they are <laughs> cured, so to say. So if I see a man barking at a dog, I'll know he's one of Victor Hiraldo's patients. Is that what you're telling me? You're right. You're right. <laughs> if somebody's whistling, because somebody has your uh, father-in-law whistles and you're very annoyed by him. So whistle along. It's, it's the most effective way. Amazing. So uh, I want to know, after working so many years as a therapist, we know that you're uh, internationally renowned for your work. What, um, what, what do you believe makes a good therapist? This applies both to music therapy and to psychology. Mm. So the, the first thing that, that is crucial is that you listen before you speak uh, and before you try to impose your own ideas on, on your patients. So just really be there and don't think you know the patient already, because everybody's very different. So that I learned also from John Cage. Listen what the person is telling you. This alone will help the person enormously. In fact, there is a famous music therapist also from Argentina, Benenson. He liked to call it music psychotherapy. And he measured he would judge how good a therapy, therapist is by the amount of time before the therapist answered. Wow. I don't want to get into, into politics that much, but if you saw uh, Trudeau the other day, when he was asked this question, he, he waited, I think, half a minute. The president of, Can of, of Canada. Can yeah, yeah. No? Uh -huh. Asked a, a difficult question, and he waited half a minute before answering. So people are afraid of silence, uh, but that's the beginning of therapy. And the second thing I would say is the willingness to help the person. Yeah. So, Victor, tell us, uh, what about, you've seen so many patients, I think in the tens of thousands, what, have they taught you anything? How have they influenced your work? This was a, a very big hospital. In, in, it's called the Medicline Bosenberg Klinik in, in St. Vendt, Germany. I'm very grateful because I, I was extremely happy for, for the nine years I worked there. And there were more than 1,000 patients per year. So every day, every week, you have at least 20 tinnitus patients coming. And I was very young when I started. I was 26. So I would listen to their stories and their crises, and many had depression and fears and anxiety. And the first thing I learned was that they didn't know how to say no. So they were often, when they arrived in this moment of crisis, they were living the lives of others. They were doing way too, much, too many things for other people and denying their own uh, necessities. So this, when I was 26, was very, very helpful, and I took it to heart. For example, we had a lot of uh, nurse, nurses, and nurses especially, 
have difficulty saying no because they aren't helpers. And the doctors or in, in these meetings to see who's gonna do the weekend or the night shift. These people that don't know how to say no, nobody answers, so they are like, yeah, me, because of the silence, it's uncomfortable. And they raise their hand, although they might have to take care of their own child, so they will come call somebody else to take on their child just to, to be able to do, be at work. So you have to be more egoistical and, and think about yourself. And in this way, you can help other people. So this I learned from my patient, to think more uh, about myself. I understand. And tell us, there are patients that you've worked with who are partly deaf, and they've received this cochlear implant, this inner ear implant. Tell us about this, and would this have helped Beethoven? Yeah, most probably. Before you get this uh, electronic implant in your cochlea, which is, goes then, sends electronic signals to the brain, it's, it's a wonder of medicine, of mm -hmm. technology. Uh, you need to uh, be sure that your nerves are working, not from the ear to the brain, the nerve. And yeah, we can assume with Beethoven this was the case, so he would have been able to hear again. Amazing. However, it is amazing and people cry and people are, are they, it's like being born again. Wow. Um, but the sound you are getting is very different from natural sound. Because uh, the natural hearing has many, many uh, infinite channels. or yeah, way, way more possibilities of combining. And this, uh, I forget how many channels you have, but it's limited. So you are processing uh, sound in a digital way. So part of music therapy with these patients who were deaf and now can hear, or were partly, or, or were having hearing loss and now can hear, is to retrain the brain and help them make music and listening more natural, to relearn it. So you have to use the brain muscle again. So we would sing with them, we will, uh, and it depends a lot how long they were having hearing prob problems, uh, how fast it goes. And Beethoven, um, he's a great example for, for therapy, because after this crisis when he wrote the Moonlight Sonata, and of course he had problems in his personal life until his death. And he was very traumatized as a child and he had to deal always with issues. But he did discover a, w a way to transform his suffering, to find peace, to accept. It is the same thing with me uh, and the tendinitis, this chronic pain I had in the arms. Two years I was completely out. Uh, and finally, after two years, I accepted this. No, I said, okay, I might never ever be able to play the piano again. Um, but life goes on. There are other things besides playing the piano. Um, this was a process, but when I reached the point, this point, I was free. I didn't have to practice anymore. This, this sick ambition of becoming a pianist was gone. Oh, and I say, okay, maybe I, be I can become a translator. Uh, I can, uh, yeah, I can enjoy my weekends and do more things with friends and, and relax more. And finally, I found my path to psychology and to music therapy, um, yeah, which, uh, in which this experience of being a patient for two years, of this intense suffering, uh, helped me a lot because it's very similar to tinnitus or to hearing loss or to hyperacusis or depression or anxiety. Well, on behalf of all your patients, and I consider myself one, uh, I'm very glad that you found your path because uh, it's very, very important work that you do. So one final question. Thank you, thank you. Sorry. What is the soundtrack that, that we live by? I, I would say that it is um, our own conditioning because um, when you think of a soundtrack, it's something that accompanies a, a movie, a film, either at the beginning, at the end, or, or in between. So life happens, and what gives it the, the color, because music with a different soundtrack, a, a movie with a different soundtrack would be perceived completely different. So it is our condition which determines what kind of experience we are having. We can judge tinnitus as an enemy, as something, a punishment, something unwanted, and this is the soundtrack we are living by. Or we can judge it as a signal, 
an ally who is trying to tell us something to improve, to live an even better life than we would without. This was the case with my chronic pain. This is the case, I mean, it's easy to say it after it happened, no? But we can assume Beethoven wouldn't have composed the Ninth Symphony. Was he not deaf? Sure. So we have to embrace this and transform it because it's what we have. Very courageous. Change our conditioning. That's the important message. Very courageous. So, Victor Heraldo, uh, I'm sure, uh, other than me, many people from tonight uh, want to stay in touch with you. How can we stay in touch with you and your work and get in touch with you? Um, I'm working as a music therapist and psychologist, um, s sticking to my path with uh, tinnitus, hyperacusis, and vertigo or dizziness. And I guess you can see my website. Yeah, uh, I have it, uh, tinnitustherapia.com. Yeah, tinnitustherapia.com. I offer online sessions and also present sessions in, in Spain and Germany. And I mean, it's, it's focused on, on tinnitus and hyperacusis, but I guess uh, other issues are also welcomed. No, so no problem accepting patients uh, that speak English or speak Spanish or? English, German, and, and Spanish. That's wonderful. Italian would be fine as well. Okay, and also Italian. So you're open to having people write to you to see your website? Please, by, by all means, by all means. It's my passion, it's my passion. And we're grateful, gr grateful that it is your passion. So for next week, we have coming up here, Professor Robert Greenberg, PhD, <laughs> cultivating music. He's coming to us live from San Francisco to tell us all about music and then some. He spent his life showing, uh, teaching uh, all of us all around the world what music is, even before teleeducation was famous. He was lecturing a video camera so that from, for those of us in the far reaches of the earth, uh, we could know about all of these things like this Beethoven Testament. So next Wednesday, Professor Robert Greenberg, PhD, Cultivating Music. The link is there in the chat room for the invitation. We look forward to welcoming you all next Wednesday. So we have uh, to thank Victor Iraldo so very much uh, for enlightening all of us, for sharing your talents. Thank you so much. Thanks very much to the, the production team. Thanks to our generous sponsors, the Student Hotel Vienna. And thanks very much to you, our participants. Without you, everything we do here just wouldn't be worth it. And we have actually, for one of our participants, a certificate of appreciation. This is to Jerome Alfred Davis, MD, pseudonym JAD33. From all of us here, we have all of our production team here. There we are. So this will be sent to you at some point by mail, <laughs> but we'll scan it in the meantime because it arrives quicker. So we're Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Davis, uh, for uh, making our program, for making us wiser, happier, and healthier. So, from Calvia, Spain, from Vienna, Austria, thank you very much. Good night, and we'll see you next Wednesday. Thank you, Victor, and Simeon, of course. Thank <laughs> Great. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Hola, Memo. <laughs> Hola. <laughs>